I'd like to welcome you to Cineculture. I'm Mary Hussein, Cineculture advisor and instructor, and I'd like to thank you so very much for joining our discussion of this beautiful film this evening. Um, I miss seeing you in person very much, and I look forward to the day when it's safe for us to be together again. Um, in the meantime, I'm working to bring as many films as possible to the community virtually, a process that has presented numerous challenges. And I'm very grateful for the collaboration of Professor Barlow de Mergadician in Armenian Studies. For those of you that are new to Cineculture, it's a film series provided at the service of the community. And it's also a campus club and an academic course. So if you're looking for a class for spring, please consider MCJ 179 Cineculture course, which also fulfills the general education multicultural degree requirement. Um, I'd like to thank um, Armenian Studies for sponsoring the film, but I also want to quickly mention that Fresno State has opened up a voting center on campus at the Student Union beginning tomorrow through Tuesday election day from nine to five every day. Um, I'd also like to mention that there has been an IMBD campaign they have, people have campaigned on IMBD to give low ratings to this film, just as they did in The Promise. So I'd be really grateful if you could honestly rate this film um, sometime soon. Um, this is a request from the directors and some people have outright given a zero to this film, which is just, I don't even have the words to express how I feel about that. Um, but hopefully that you can help support this to have a more accurate reflection of the film's um, quality. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our guest discussant, Professor Barlow de Mergadician. It's always a special honor to introduce him. I am delighted to continue Cineculture's longtime collaboration with Armenian Studies. 13 years ago, when I became Cineculture advisor and instructor, I reached out to Professor de Mergadician and we've been working together to bring Armenian themed films to our community ever since. Professor Demergadichian is a barbarian coordinator of the Armenian Studies program. He teaches a variety of courses in the program, including language, art, history, and literature. His dedication and tireless efforts to bring a wide range of Armenian theme events to Fresno is truly phenomenal. Please join me in thanking Professor Demergadichian for his extraordinary service to our community um, and thank you again for joining us, um, Professor Barlow de Mergadician. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Hussein. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, once again with Cineculture and to share some of my ideas and thoughts about uh, the film that I hope that all of you had the chance to watch, which was Lost Birds. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe that it's been 13 years since uh, we've been collaborating, but it is uh, really been one of the most productive and most popular uh, events when the Armenian Studies program has worked with Cineculture to bring uh, films uh, to Fresno State and to bring their directors and, and to have those discussions. Uh, to tonight, uh, because we can't have the directors with them, I'm gonna be giving uh, a few of my thoughts and a few of my uh, observations about the movie. Uh, you are gonna have the chance to ask, an ask some questions and you can use the uh, question and answer uh, box in uh, Zoom to go ahead and ask those questions at any time. And then once I finish my comments, uh, we're gonna open it up uh, to a discussion with Professor Hussein, myself, and whoever has questions and we'll read those questions and we'll see where we're, uh, we're headed with, uh, with that. So my, uh, my first thought was that this, this was a, just a wonderful metaphorical story that these directors uh, took the stories uh, which actually came from Aren Perdeci. Uh, Aren Perdeci is one of the co-directors. Uh, Aren was born in Istanbul in 1979, and he has uh, directed and been a script writer and producer for several short films. And he has directed many commercials and musical videos. And his co-director is Ella Alyamaj. Uh, she was also born in Istanbul. She studied film production and film studies at Chapman University in Southern California. And she has also produced uh, various films. And her first, their first feature uh, length film was called Fairy Dust in 2008. So going back to this uh, story, um, the, the way the story came about or the movie came about was that uh, both Aden and 
Ella live in Turkey. And uh, up until, you know, just recently, it was very difficult to talk about the genocide openly in Turkey. And uh, so Aden had really not heard much about his own family history. But he learned that his great grandfather had been a, a victim of the Armenian genocide. And he wanted to really write something that would, in a sense, memorialize that, that story. Um, now, I said that the directors call this uh, a historical fairy tale. That's, that's the words that they used. And um, when, I, when I hear that, I think of you know, what we consider today blockbuster movies. I'm, I, I always think of Titanic as kind of this example of a blockbuster movie because it's about a big event, right? It's about this uh, tragedy that we all know what's gonna happen. But what uh, attracts our interest is the love story. So the way the director is able to tell a story through uh, uh, two individuals or a family uh, in the midst of a, of, of a struggle for survival is always uh, makes it an interesting movie. And there's plenty of other disaster movies like that that Hollywood has produced. So they usually take that storyline and, and then develop it. Uh, and then we as the, uh, the audience are drawn into that story. Um, the directors uh, have a very interesting quote. They said that in, in their own words, they said they took a minimal story from a big historical event that is the genocide and told the story in an epic and grand style, end quote. And I thought that's kind of a, a really good way to start to think about uh, this film. And I wanted to start out by just talking a little bit about the Armenian genocide, because actually the word genocide is not mentioned in the film, is it? Um, it's, it's, simply, it's simply not a literal retelling of the story of the genocide. But the, the Armenian genocide, uh, which took place beginning in 1915, taking place in Ottoman uh, Turkey, was when more than a million and a half Armenians were killed uh, in this first genocide of the 20th century. And what makes this movie different than other movies about uh, the Armenian genocide is that it was not a documentary, but a story unlike any that I've seen on uh, the Armenian genocide. Probably all of you anticipated and saw the movie, The Promise, uh, which came out on the 100th anniversary of the genocide, which was a much more literal historic story with, with sort of the, the action that was taking place and uh, you know the word wars and genocide it was all in there. Uh, or earlier, maybe, maybe you had seen Adam Agoyan's film, Arara, which uh, gained critical acc acclaim, but not too much popular acclaim. Uh, it's kind of a movie within a movie about, about the genocide. But uh, in a discussion with the directors, uh, they said that they wanted to make a movie about memories. And I think that's really important uh, to, to think about when we watch this movie. Um, memories are the central aspect of this uh, film. So I think that what the directors wanted to do was to make a human film. Uh, and they, what they did was able to capture memories and, you know, for Armenians, if they survived the Armenian genocide, uh, many Armenians wrote what are called today memoirs, genocide memoirs. And those are really just memories, aren't they? Uh, I mean, when I say just memories, they are the life story of those individuals who survived the Armenian genocide. And those memories then become the stuff of what we talk about. We talk about our grandparents or great grandparents' memories. So I think that's, that's the central core if we, if we think of the film from that approach. Um, the directors wanted to, I think, bridge the gap in the genocide story because there's, there's several ways of telling a story, right? We can tell a story from a very literal perspective as a historian or maybe a, a, pol a political scientist or a politician. Uh, so politicians are good at taking stories and, and, and making a narrative. But when we take uh, those positions, historians and politicians, often we, uh, we get angry because they're telling a story that we disagree with or that we have a different opinion about uh, because we, get, we, we become emotionally involved, but uh, we also become angry. And I think again, in their own words, they said that quote, we believe that the movie will show the human side of the exile and it will help people share and discuss their own stories. So this is really, I think, uh, what we're here about today in this class and, and you know, it, really about what we do at the university is listening to the stories that people tell so that we understand that human beings are human beings, 
that the Armenian genocide is one part of the human history, uh, but it's something that should be told. Uh, but our directors chose to do it in a way which was, which was quite unique. Now the movie, movie itself, I thought uh, from my own perspective as someone who teaches Armenian history and culture was very authentically presented. So they took a lot of effort, uh, a lot of effort to make everything in this film very authentic. Um, and they also had an advisor and that advisor was Dr. Vahe Tashyan. And he's the director of what's called the Husha Madian project. Uh, that's an online project based in uh, Berlin, Germany. And the purpose of it is to recreate the life of Ottoman Armenians. And what they do is they collect photographs, maps, music, stories, and they have collected them and organized them by villages and towns so that we can go into their website and really kind of go back into that period of time. So I think that was important that uh, Vahe Tashyan was uh, also part of this uh, project. You may ask about some of the set settings. All of it was authentic. The movie was shot on location in the Armenian highland, that is Eastern, Eastern Turkey, which is ancient Armenia, historic Armenia. Uh, the village that you saw, the home that you saw, the church, uh, all of the central settings were very authentic. I thought it was interesting, and it's something I can um, ask again the audience too, that the, it was interesting that the main language spoken by the characters was Turkish. And you may have expected that to have been Armenian, but the movie was made in Turkey. And I think that uh, they did that, the directors did that because they wanted to make it something that could be uh, attractive to a Turkish audience, a way for a Turkish audience to be drawn into this story. Um, so it would be unlikely that Armenians would have spoken uh, only Turkish in their own homes. We did, we did see some uh, Armenian spoken um, and sometimes the Armenian didn't seem exactly authentic, some few parts into it, that's a minor criticism. But um, what I found interesting was the period of time. Do you remember when the film was set? Can you remember uh, what period of time it was? It was right around Easter time, right? Easter time because there were talking about the Armenian traditions of dying eggs. That's a very common uh, tradition and the passing of the lit candles. So you remember that they heard singing and they opened the doors and there was a, a group of people holding candles. And uh, that is very traditional because on Easter Eve, uh, there is what is called a, a, a literally a, a, a liturgy or mass of the, of the candles and people light candles and then they take those candles home to, to illustrate the light that Jesus brought. So this was very authentic. Uh, it really reminded me also at the beginning about the idea of uh, Easter as rebirth, looking to the future. However, we also saw that the children's mother was uh, superstitious um, and several events showed that she felt, you know, it was unlucky and kind of the bird was the key to it, right? This bird, which was kind of lost birds do you remember what the name of the bird was? It was Bachik. Bachik in Armenian means kiss. Uh, so the bird was uh, an important part of this uh, important part of this film. Um, now I'd like to just move to briefly talk a little bit about the structure of the film, uh, just how I saw the the filmmakers look at the structure and to kind of put that in the context of Armenian history. As I said, the first third of the film, I think really the first 30 minutes, we really got the, the sense of this Armenian family and the community they lived in. Everything seemed quite normal, quite happy in fact. The children were very playful. Um, people were you know, getting along with each other. Everything was kind of very happy. There was one slight, however, hint that things weren't normal. And I wonder if you could think about that before I tell you what that was. There was something which already hinted that something was amiss. That was uh, when Kanar's husband, the mother's husband, uh, was not seen in the movie because he had already been serving in the army. Uh, and that's our introduction to World War I. So World War I is the context for the Armenian genocide. Um, and it's important to know that because uh, Armenians were drafted into the Turkish army in World War I. And then uh, they were disarmed later and killed. And that was the, actually the beginning of the genocide. So we saw, we didn't see this husband and he's kind of in the background, but uh, he, he never appears again. 
Um, so the anxiety, which was felt by Kanar, the mother, was clearly one that many Armenian women would have, um, would have felt. Um, I'd like the grandparents too. Uh, it was a sense of family, extended family. That would have been quite common in um, Armenia at this time for, uh, for everyone to be together. Uh, the second part of the moody movie, the mood changed really rapidly and it became, became with uh, almost again, sort of um, not a direct kind of thing, but kind of told through almost, it looked like a silhouette of soldiers, didn't it? Um, the soldiers suddenly appeared and they began to search for weapons. Uh, and then they arrested the grandfather, took him away. And then very interestingly, um, and this is where it's, it, it was one of the uh, things that the directors talked about, uh, when this all was taking place, the arrest of the grandfather, and then uh, they were waiting for him to come back. They expected him to come back. Suddenly it started raining and there was thunder, if you remember that. Uh, the, the film director said that that was actually something that they had thought that there was going to be no thunder and no rain. And that suddenly appeared right at the moment when they were going to film. And it really reflects the sadness and anxiety uh, that uh, this family felt when suddenly they lost their father and then, uh, then they lost their uh, the grandfather as well. Um, of course, the central figures are the two children, Bedros and Mariam. Uh, by the way, all of the all of the characters in the film are Armenian. All of the main characters are Armenian, and that was an intentional intentional uh, move by the directors. Um, they went to play in their in their palace in their in their little place out in the hills. And when they returned to their home, we're suddenly struck by the enormity of what had taken place. So really the genocide had already taken place, the deportation of the village. And when the children come back, they see there's nothing there, right? There's, there's an abandoned church, the house is in disarray. Uh, there's a village, nobody's around. They look at the hearth, the hearth is the center of the family and it was cold, the ashes were, were out of it. Um, all of this was symbolic of what had been lost. And you know, children, how do they process, uh, how do they process tragedy? Uh, well, these children kind of were just playing games, weren't they still? Uh, until they began to comprehend that, you know, their, their mother was gone and everyone was gone. And then you, you really get that feeling of loneliness, don't you? Uh, desolation and abandonment. Uh, they have each other, they're with each other, but then even they are separated. And then we get another level of separation, which I felt really was very emotionally moving that uh, you know these so close brother and sister were separated again, and uh, Bedo was taken by a Turkish family, um, which was common, and then Maryam uh, ultimately ended up uh, in in the orphanage. Um, now, music plays an important role in this film. Uh, it's all authentic Armenian music, um, and there's a lot of um, there's an Armenian hymn which is sung in the church called Dervornia, Lord Have Mercy. And at the most sort of emotional moments, that was the backdrop of the film. They were singing, uh, Lord have mercy, especially when Mariam was uh, by herself and looking for her brother and her, her family. Orphanage, uh, the orphanage was important, I thought, uh, because it was a place that became a safe place for Mariam. And one of the key figures in the whole film is the Turkish man, uh, Uncle Mahmoud, uh, who is kind of the caretaker, I guess, assistant and he begins to take a liking to Mariam and watches over her. Um, and then the rest of the film as it, as it plays out, which I'm sure you all watched, of course. And then finally, when they are able to reunite with their mother in Aleppo, uh, they release the bird on the way to, to visit their mother in Aleppo. And I think that kind of symbolized this new beginning that they, that they had. Aleppo is important because um, many Armenian survivors uh, had ended up, who survived, uh, ended up in Aleppo. Um, you might think this is a happy ending, but was it really a happy ending? Mother and children were reunited, but we never learned about what happened to the grandfather and grandmother, although we can imagine. And of course, the life that they lived is, is gone forever. Um, as I said, the musical score was quite beautiful. I thought the cinematography was uh, very uh, I liked it because it took its time. In other words, the scenes, the scenes lasted a long time. I think that's more European, probably Mary would say, than what we mm -hmm. typically get in the United States. Yeah. But it wasn't rushed. It allowed the viewer to really enter into, into the world of the movie. Uh, the, the costumes were authentic. Uh, they had been uh, really studied and historically 
uh, looked at. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, leave you with a question that maybe we can discuss. Did the film have a purpose? So maybe we can talk, talk about that or other questions or other things. Well, I'm gonna uh, bring, bring the first question that we have. And the question is, do they really have orphanages for Armenian kids during the genocide? And so I'm really glad that Catherine asked this question. Um, I did post an article for students in the Cineculture course about that because there were definitely orphanages. And if you could speak to that, Professor Dermogadigian. So uh, when the genocide began and, and many of the adults, of course, were taken away, uh, a lot of children uh, did survive. Um, and of those that did survive, some were taken into Kurdish or Turkish families, but there was a very wide network of Protestant missionaries. And in fact, in the movie, uh, the, the woman that was there was, her name was Kraft. And uh, the Kraft family was a missionary family in Turkey. And the, uh, the American missionaries did set up orphanages uh, for Armenians. And especially after 1918, when uh, World War One had ended, uh, there were many orphanages and there was a huge move to try to reunite, you know, kids with their families. Of course, it, it was almost impossible. Uh, and there were also orphanages in the area of what is today Armenia. So, yes, uh, I, I would probably say that's a very common, a very common experience for many Armenian families that uh, they would know someone that's an orphan. I had an uncle who uh, survived the genocide and ended up in an orphanage in Jerusalem. That's just where they took him. And um, tens of thousands of children were in these orphanages. It saved their lives, uh, but of course, then they grew up without really a, a childhood. Um, there's another question here. Um, Lisa Manoyan is thanking, thanking, um, thanking us for the supportive media and the film. And she has a question about, are we going to show the Gomidas movie that was this year released? I wasn't able to watch it and I'm having difficulty finding it on social media. So if you know anything about that movie, please um, share the information. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know a lot about it. I'll have to look into it and get back to you. So uh, just email us or something and I'll try to get back to you on it as far as I'm not sure the release of the, about the release of it. So that's, that's really, I don't want to say anything because I'm not really sure about it. Well, but thank, and thank you for bringing the film to our attention. We're always looking for new and, and good movies, but there is, as uh, Professor Demerdici mentioned, there are, um, you know, time release dates and availability, but um, we can follow up. Um, here's another film, a question. How did a film about the Armenian genocide make it through Turkish censorship of the, of the genocide? And where did they find all these great actors, especially the two kids? And this question is from my colleague, Dr. Rosemary Kuhn. Thank you for posing the, the question. Well, uh, you know, this is, this is one of the things that's quite interesting that uh, I would say right up until the early part of the 21st century, that is in the, up until the early 2000s, it would have been almost, it would have been impossible to make a film about the genocide, even though it's not called the genocide, uh, because uh, in Turkey for an Armenian to do this would have been very difficult. It's, it's very ironical that today's president of Turkey, uh, Erdogan, who, we're, I'm gonna get off a little bit off the subject, but all of you know that there's a war going on in Karabakh and in Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan is attacking the Armenians in Karabakh, that President Erdogan, who is supporting that, actually, when he first came, became prime minister of Turkey, he actually opened up things a little bit in Turkey, and people began to be able to speak about the genocide. However, uh, this was a struggle to secure uh, funding for the film. Uh, they did get a little bit of money from the Turkish Ministry of Culture, so that was something that was very important. But as, as uh, Professor Hussein mentioned at the beginning, there was actually an international campaign uh, by the Turkish community to give very poor ratings to the film and to try to cover up the film. So it, it, it is almost sort of a paradox. Uh, the film was able to be made. And then once it was made, uh, it, it had a lot of difficulty getting, getting out. I seem to remember, I have a question, follow-up question for you. I seem to recall that the directors mentioned they, even when they were shooting in the communities where they were filming, they weren't 
they had to be kind of secretive about it, um, not very direct. Um, I wonder if you can recall their description of, of that process. Yeah, I think I think it had dealt with the house that they uh, mm. that they filmed in the house that they they filmed in because uh, it's it's still it's still very difficult to talk about. You you can't just say you know you're filming a genocide film or even a, a mm -hmm. film that has it's about Armenians that's a little bit too direct. So I think they had to be very careful about it. And just, uh, I, I don't know exactly how they couched it, but uh, they were able to use those uh, original houses in, in, in those areas. Um, and here's a question. I'm not sure um, if we have that information. What was the budget of the film and where did funding come from? Uh, I, don't have the, I don't have the amount, uh, total amount, but it said they did receive a very small amount. And I don't know how much that is. Uh, from uh, the government, from the Ministry of Culture, they have a cinema fund that did help to uh, produce it. But I don't know the budget. I should have, uh, I should have looked that up. Yeah. Um, here's another question. Who would have moved into the house they used to reside? A Turkish family or an, Ar or an Armenian family? Well, um, typically uh, the Armenian genocide, which began in 1915, was marked by a deportation. So Literally everyone in a village or a small town would be forced to leave their homes. The Turkish government already had a plan in place that there were uh, Muslim refugees who had left European Turkey uh, in this period and were in Turkey and they were resettled in Armenian homes. So more than likely it would have been either Turks or local Kurds, Kurdish people, uh, who if they were able to take those homes over, sometimes the property, not even sometimes, most of the time, the property that was left was auctioned off at a pittance at a very small uh, cost. And so uh, certain Turkish officials actually became wealthy by buying these houses and then, and then selling them for a profit. Um, here's another question about orphanages. Were orphanages um, segregated by gender? Was that common back then? Yes, it, it was. Uh, there would be there would be sections if, if it was a single orphanage, it would be it would be uh, segregated or it would be simply an orphanage which was all for boys or all for for girls. So that was pretty common for the period. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that was probably common internationally as well. That's probably how orphanages were managed during that time period. And and, and we looked in the film, uh, the little girl they weren't going to take her right at first mm -hmm. because she was girl a girl and. And then they finally said, well, there's no place for her to go, so. Right. So here's another question. What was the director's idea behind ending the movie with a scene the audience had seen before? I'm not sure about that. What do you mean by the scene before? I'm not sure either. Um, but I think I think the question that I, that I said, and maybe it's something that people can comment in the question and answer is, uh, you know, what, what did they hope to achieve, right? Was this a film that had uh, a purpose um, and something that we can still talk about before, mm -hmm. you know, we end today? And a point that I re recall that was very interesting, some criticism was the film, it, of, of the film wasn't that it wasn't stark enough. It wasn't, in a way, didn't show the brutality of the genocide to the same extent as some other films have. But this was also a film that is acceptable for children, that um, the way it was presented, this is a way to teach children about the genocide, which is the only film I've heard of that, that took that position. Well, I think I think you're right, and in fact, the the film did open in Turkey in Istanbul, so it did open to film audiences, and I think it may go back to um, it may go back to what we talked about or I talked about earlier, which is when you show things literally. If you were to show uh, a massacre or people getting killed, mm -hmm. that is certainly a way to to uh, get people emotional, but it also engenders for some people anger. And then it kind of cuts off bridges of communication. Right. So if, if, if we hope to really heal from the genocide, I think most people realize that the Turkish people themselves have to heal. That is, they have to acknowledge it. And I think that's a really big part of uh, the genocide is that it has not been acknowledged by, uh, by Turkey up until today. 
Um, here's another question. How do you think an orphanage like the one in the film went undetected for so long without being destroyed by Turkish troops or turned into a re-education center? Is this accurate or more than likely a fictional conclusion? Well, the thing is that the orphanages, remember, were run by American, uh, often by American missionaries. And uh, the United States was not uh, at war with Turkey. Uh, the United States didn't enter World War I until 1917. And actually, Americans were always looked pretty kindly on. So I think the government basically just didn't want to uh, cause any problem by, you know, closing an American run orphanage. So uh, they were they weren't they weren't uh, they weren't shut down. Um, they may they may have di difficulty, but uh, they certainly were able to function. Here's another question, and I, I just have to preface this question by saying I wish. Was there a sequel to this film? The story of Beto and Miriam was a key role. I wonder um, how their life turned out. That's a great question, isn't it? Uh, I don't think there was, um, was or is actually a, a sequel to, to the movie. So we, we really don't know what uh, life would have been like. More than likely, uh, it would have been one of two options. One is that they may have ended up back in Istanbul uh, well, they were in Aleppo. So if they were in Aleppo, more than likely, uh, they would have ended up either in Lebanon or in Europe or in America. So there was really no going back uh, at that point. Um, I have another question here. Who were the rebels mentioned in the church when the pre priest was debriefing the people? So the priest was announcing to the people that there, had, there was an order coming from, uh, there was an order coming for the government for people to turn in their... Uh, passports or identity cards. So in Turkey at that time, you had to have, you had to have actually, um, you actually had to have a, uh, an identity card in order to be able to travel. So once that was said, then all of a sudden, uh, the people in the front row began to protest and say, no, we can't do that. If we do that, uh, you know, we're gonna be in trouble. And then one of them said, you know, oh, those rebels. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons one of the reasons that uh, some Turkish government officials use is that there were Armenians who were re re rebelling against the Turks. Uh, and in, for that reason, it's, they were looking for weapons and, and deporting people, but that's all a fabrication. But, but there were some people that were uh, political rebels. And so, uh, you know, for, the, for the most of the population, they were in a very bad position because to support that would put them in trouble with the government. I have to say, mention that the student who asked this question, Tro, was a family whose, whose family did resist and they went to that location that was mentioned in The Promise and, um, and ended up in, in yeah. Beirut. Uh -huh. So um, I have another- And I do question. want to mention, uh, just Mary, uh, for a moment, uh, very sadly, the, the, the actor who played the priest in the movie, his name is Arto Arsenian. He's actually a well-known uh, singer. Uh, he passed away just yesterday from COVID. So we just learned that from the, from the director. So mm -hmm. kind of a sad, sad thing to say, but it's important, I thought. Very sad, thank you for sharing that. Um, let's see, here's another one. It flashes back to the eve of Easter when the family was happy together in their home. I believe it was to show what they had lost. So I think perhaps that this was a response to someone's, to an earlier question. I'm not sure. Um, let me go on here. Maybe we'll get more, the, the author Rebecca can expand um, with another question. Um, from Dr. Kuhn, I had the same question regarding the ending of the film. This is a scene where Miriam and Beto's family open the door to share candles on Easter Eve. So I think that's a response here. Right, and that, that's, that's the rebirth part, right? So even though all of this had taken place, so they kind of go back, I think they go back to this, as Christians, as, as the Armenians are predominantly Christian, as Christians, they have hope for the future, even though they've gone through much tragedy. And then another student commented that the closing scene was the one where the family was sitting down together having dinner. Then the town people came to light the candle right. to symbolize Christ had risen. Let's right. see. Um, okay, so actually, um, okay, here's a question. Um, 
Is there an objective documentary about the Armenian genocide that you would recommend, preferably in English? Um, there, there are several, right, Professor Demirgadichian? Right. We have. Uh, uh, there are actually uh, what I would call simply uh, straightforward documentaries. And if you look up an organization called the Armenian Film Foundation, uh, they have quite a few of their uh, movies on YouTube. And actually, you can find uh, several several very good documentaries on YouTube that give you sort of the factual history of the Armenian genocide. And then if you want to move into the more fictional, you know, movies like Ararat, The Promise, there are uh, many of those, actually, some really good ones. There's an Italian film uh, that's really good um, that tells an Armenian story. So there's several of them. And um, we we'll just have to, you know, if you're interested, you can email us and we'll give you a list. And here's a question from another student, Shelby, were the actors Armenian or Turkish? I think you spoke to that in your opening remarks that the actors were Armenian. Is that correct, um, Professor? Yeah, Dunbar, it's, uh, yes, because I was reading about the background of it and he, they said that, uh, that because Aden was a descendant of Armenians who went through the genocide, both, although both filmmakers were born in Istanbul, they were determined, I'm just reading it, it says they were determined to ensure that all of the actors in their films were of Armenian descent. So yes, they were all Armenians. And then she goes on to say that all the actors did a, did a great job portraying emotion. The family unit had wonderful chemistry and I absolutely have to agree with, uh, with, right. with your response. Right. Here's another one. What do you believe the main purpose or idea is of this film and who do you think the film um, is directed towards? I assume they mean, uh, Tachin means uh, the target audience. Well, I, I would open it up to everybody on that and think about it because I think, I think different audiences would receive it differently. I mean, an Armenian audience would receive it uh, in probably in a different way. I think it's clearly directed at an international audience that is not only for Armenians to be able to, um, again, transmit these stories, right? And maybe make people interested. So some of you got interested and said, well, can I see a movie, another movie, right? Uh, so, or can I read about it? Or maybe you'd want to read an Armenian memoir. There's so many interesting memoirs, so many fascinating memoirs uh, about the genocide, but they're human stories, right? They, they could be about any uh, tragedy of the 20th century. Uh, and in that way, it makes it a more human, human film. And I'm trying to interpret this next one. Um, if the point of view of the characters were, a, were adults in the film rather than children, would the movie have been made at all because of a negative reaction? I guess the, 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 the student Holland is asking, could you have made this point, movie in Turkey from an adult point of view? Or was it allowed to be released because it was in a children's perspective? That's a very good question. I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know if it could have been. And I think it would depend on the film. You'd actually have to see the film and how it was right. made. Right, right. Um, so um, we, we have more time. So if you'd like to type your questions, we'd be grateful. And um, you know, should we do our poll now too, Mary? Sure, can... great idea. Thank you. So we have a poll, everyone. It's just, it'll take you just about one minute to do. I'm going to uh, share it with everybody. And if you could just answer the questions and then we'll continue with our uh, discussion. Um, I'm just gonna launch the poll. It's, it's a little bit of a review, kind of a rating thing. So, um, so we can do that. Okay, I'm just gonna launch it. You should be able to see it. So just go ahead and vote how you wanna rate the film. And then you just do all the answers and then you just submit it. So we'll just take, it should take to no more than a few minutes to do. Great. Interesting. Well, this is really interesting. Yeah, it's great. It's good, good getting feedback on. I, it's unfortunate we're not able to be together to talk about it, but it's good to get some feedback on it, I think, so. Absolutely. You can actually just keep asking questions because they can continue the poll and then. Okay, I'll minimize the poll then. Yeah. Um, hmm. Let's see. 
Okay, someone is asking for films, uh, non-YouTube films, I, I assume related to this topic, uh, Armenian genocide films, or are right. there any well, other I mean, there, actually, we, we discovered this movie is actually on uh, Prime, right? Um, yes. So there are some movies, I believe, that are accessible through streaming, uh, streaming kinds of things, but uh, you know, if you want to buy a film, as I said, or something like that, we can again give you some ideas of where to go to to get those. Okay. And the promise is one definitely I we would recommend, and it's available it is, it's on a, Amazon it's a really Prime good movie, too, yeah. or Netflix. I can't remember which streaming mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. So here's another question: Was there any significance to the blue and red Beto and Miriam dressed in throughout the film? That's a great question. I didn't I didn't pay a great deal of attention to that, so I'm thinking about that. Um, no, I, I can't. I can't think of it, but it, it may have be maybe something that we can uh, we can ask the directors about. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, will, will you share the result of the poll? Yeah, I guess we can to whoever needs to. Yeah, okay. actually, it's ended right now. Let's just end it, and I think I think it is share. I can share it. Okay, thank you. There you go. So we'll leave it there for a minute. I'm happy to see all the students and also the community members in Fresno State um, staff and faculty. Let's see. So professors talking still works. <laughs> I do hear about the film. Okay, let's see. Um, you mentioned boosting the film's rating. Mm -hmm. How could you do that? And I, I'd like to clarify, not necessarily boosting, but giving an honest appraisal because of this campaign to give zeros to the film was a, was a intentional strategic to, um, I would say, prevent people from viewing the film. Yes, I think the, the issue was that there was actually a concerted effort by uh, people in the Turkish community, perhaps, uh, to just vote zero, you know, so as I, as Professor Hussein said, I would just, you know, put in, put in your honest, honest review for it. That's, that's all they're looking for. Exactly. I mean, they certainly don't want to give a false rating, uh, like what they receive, but you, your honest appraisal of the film would be appreciated. Um, one um, student, Ed, thought that perhaps the color, the red and blue referred to gender roles. I don't really know. I think that'd be a question for the directors, what their intention was. Yes, I don't know. I, yeah, I can't tell you that. Um, I don't see any questions that I didn't bring up. Um, I have a question for uh, Professor de Mergadician. What of, of all aspects of this film struck you the most or had the most impact on you? That's a great question. <laughs> I, to me, it was just, I think, to me, as someone who has relatives who went through the genocide, I think it's just the, to me, it kind of is a, a sadness uh, for the sense of loss. Um, because the film, no film, no film could encompass all of that. Um, all of that feeling that this is a, a time and a place which is gone now, and that was through this genocide. Uh, it's again, a feeling of injustice because the Turkish government simply refuses to acknowledge the genocide. Uh, it's not anger, it's not, it's not those emotions. It's just, it's just that it was uh, really sad and obviously sad for these children and their mother, what they had to go through. And we could, we could talk about it today, right? Just open up any news source about something going on in the world today and we see just about everywhere in the world something similar, right? Families being separated. Uh, we don't want to go into that, but uh, you know, uh, all over the world. So I think that's what struck me the most. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, another person asked about if the actors were Turkish, I believe. And yes, we, we ta you talked about that, that the actors were all Armenian. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I do want to remind people that if uh, you're interested in uh, cineculture or Armenian studies events uh, with Armenian studies, we have our own Facebook page and you can find, we do have two more upcoming events. 
One is going to be on November the 12th. We actually have a, a professor from Rutgers University, uh, Dr. Gersel. She's actually Turkish, but she studies the photography of Armenian families who were leaving Turkey in the late 19th century and early 20th century and how those photographs tell a story. So it really ties in, I think, with this film. It's going to be on Thursday, uh, November the 12th at 7 p.m. And it will be a webinar, so you can find a link on it as well. Thank you. Um, here's another question about film ratings. Are these campaigns to review um, films about the genocide common? And I think you spoke to that, that they really, this is not the first film this has happened to. So uh, the film, The Promise was a film which had a huge budget and it was, it was well talked about. There were, it was a $90 million budget. And uh, the news about the promotion of this before it came out, it was like a year, year and a half before. And an organized anti-promise campaign started where people were actually putting out comments, uh, saying bad things about the film before they'd even seen the film. And then when, of course, when you can start to rate it, they also began to rate it poorly. Even when, uh, when it was gonna be at movie theaters, opening at movie theaters, people were buying tickets online or reserving tickets so that people would think it would be sold out and then they wouldn't be buying them. So it was a way to try to suppress the, uh, the distribution. So let's see, was the story that children played as princes and knight with their bird a traditional Armenian story? Do you think that pretend play was significant or symbolic of their journey? Uh, what was the last sentence about their symbolic? Um, was, was their pretend play significant oh. or symbolic of their journey? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the story itself, I believe, uh, would be a common one. I mean, there's plenty of fairy tales in Armenian stories. There are a lot of Armenian fairy tales. A lot of them have to do with princesses and princes and kings. And there are birds and magical creatures. So I think uh, Aran took this from stories from his own grandmother and crafted his own sort of story with it. I guess the bird was in a sense, uh, uh, the bird was this idea, I think of freedom at the end, but freedom meaning, you know, uh, they're no longer in their own country. And it just, that was the end of the story with it. Um, here's a question, not about the film per se, but there's a question um, about the Armenian flag and what is going on in terms of demonstrations in Fresno. Um, related to Armenia. And I assume that this is, um, I've been huddled, quarantined in my house, but I assume it's about the conflict in, in Armenia today in Nargo Karabakh. Well, the fighting, uh, the fighting began on September 27th. And I'm just gonna give a very brief uh, summary okay. of it because um, this war is about uh, the area called Karabakh uh, or Artsakh in Armenian, uh, where the people who are Armenian had uh, declared their independence about 26 years ago after another war. Um, so what the Armenian communities throughout the world are doing is to try to bring attention, to bring attention to our own governments and to the public uh, about what's happening there because it's, it's really very bad. Meaning that um, this is not just a fight that Azerbaijan is doing. We know that um, mercenaries are being sent there, paid soldiers from different countries, Turkey is supporting and so it's a, it's a very bad situation. It's a very potentially uh, another genocide. Armenians feel that this is a second genocide and the world is simply watching uh, and allowing Turkey to, to do this along with Azerbaijan. And so people are, need to do something. They wanna go out and they wanna go out and, and to just peacefully demonstrate and to say that uh, this is what's happening. Um, here's a question uh, back to the film. Were Armenians superstitious at this point in time? My reason for the question is because when the kids first find the bird and try to bring it home, the mom says it will bring bad luck to the family. I think superstition uh, is uh, a part of the tradition, was part of the tradition. I mean, although Armenians were Christian, I think there were some strong uh, superstitions that were still uh, around. And uh, it could be about dreams. You know, people could have certain dreams that would be interpreted in certain ways or certain types of animals were even considered to be bad luck. And especially uh, a bird or a crow or something like that would also be considered to be bad luck. And I think those sentiments still exist around the world today. Yes, for sure. 
So is there a point that you'd like to, um, that you particularly like the audience to take away from this film, um, Professor Demergadetian? Um, I would much rather hear from you. Tell me, you tell me what you took away because I, I don't think I, I'm in a position to tell you what, what, it, what you take away from it. In other words, I think the film was there and whatever you took away that's positive or, or whatever it is, Maybe you can write in to Professor Hussein, it might be interesting, or to me, and just, you know, tell us your comments and we'll put them together because uh, we really want to hear what you have to say. It's, it's not about just myself or someone just telling you what you should, you should be thinking. And actually, I'll be hearing from the Cineculture students, they'll be writing their reflections on the film, and everyone interprets a film from the, con from the framework of their own lived experience, from their own context. So a film is a text, and so everyone's interpretation will be slightly different based on their life experiences. That's part of the beauty of cinema. It is. And the power to touch our hearts and minds, which I, I'm uh, strong. I feel like this is such a beautiful film. It definitely touched my heart. And that truly is the power of cinema. Um. So uh, students, um, do you have any final questions? Oh, you know, this wasn't asked in the, in the chat, but um, the United States has not recognized the Armenian genocide in contrast to many European countries that have. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, actually the United States did, uh, did recognize the genocide. If you go back in history, uh, there was an American ambassador, Morgenthau, who was in Turkey in 1915. Mm -hmm. uh, he, did, he did say what was going on. Uh, uh, government officials did say that. President Ronald Reagan has, has uh, recognized the Armenian genocide. And, and just last year in 2019, the Congress passed a resolution uh, recognizing the Armenian genocide. So. Uh, we put a lot of effort into that. I, I think really it's, it's a question of Turkey someday recognizing the genocide, but it's got to be Turkey's people who, who demand that and who eventually will change their own government. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess my, my comment was that I don't think there's, has there, there hasn't yet to be a formal genocide resolution passed. Um, that was my understanding by the Congress and the president. Well, the, 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 actually, if you go back in October of 2019, there was uh, an official uh, House resolution that also mm -hmm. was passed by the Senate. Okay. Uh, and it's very important, but it wasn't one that required the president's signature. So I don't think it ever got to his, his desk. I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Let's see. I wanna make sure I'm paging down here. Okay. Oh, this is a nice comment from Dr. Kuhn. I saw the film before and I'm so glad I was able to see it again. It also shows that in the worst possible situation, there are some people who are ready to help. Yeah, I think the, I think the role of the Turkish uh, caretaker was important because there were Turks and Kurds who did help Armenians during the genocide and it shows the humanity of, uh, of all people. Absolutely. Here's another uh, comment. What I took away from this movie is the fact that it confirms what I had heard when I was growing up. Um, and the, the author of this question is Armenian, I believe. The men were taken away first, then they came back for the women, and then they came back for the children. Right, and that is true. Yeah, definitely. Okay, here's another uh, question from a, one of my students. You mentioned that there is a potential second genocide. What is it, why does it seem like not many countries care in the world? Why does it seem like it's Armenia versus the world? That is kind of the million dollar question uh, about just about everything that happens in the world, right? I mean, you could talk about uh, other places in the world and uh, you know, the world, the world runs right now about interests, interests of nations, uh, politics, uh, money, uh, military, they all intersect. And there are so many countries that have so many ties with Turkey, uh, mm -hmm. as compared to Armenia, a country of 3 million, Karabakh with a population of under 200,000 against 80 million Turks in Turkey. I'm not saying against the people, but the government. And then also Azerbaijan. Uh, 
there's just so much interest, you know, there's uh, American bases, NATO, there's, it's a whole long history of why it's difficult for, um, for the United States uh, to, to tell everybody to stop. And in fact, uh, president, the president did try to broker a peace agreement, but it was ignored by the Azeri. So uh, it's very difficult. Well, I think we're almost out of time here, unless anyone has some last minute questions here. Is there anything you'd like to add in closing? And I think, I think uh, if you're interested in, uh, interested in any of uh, more questions about genocide or about uh, the Armenians, feel free to contact me with email. Uh, I'll try to help you out with any questions. But I think, um, you know, tell people about this film. It is available. Uh, you can you can get it on. Um, you can you can buy it through Amazon. You can uh, tell people about it, and I think it just helps to spread the word. Um, and I say the word. It's it's just a good film to start with, uh, and it's telling a very real good story. Well, thank you very much, uh, the community members and students, faculty, staff for joining us. Thank you, uh, Professor Demergadichian, for your collaboration. I look forward to future upcoming collaborations. And, for, and to the Cineculture audience, um, I will be posting films in the future for public screenings, webinars, and film access. So stay tuned. And if you'd like to know more about upcoming films, you can go to the Cineculture website, cineculture.csufresno.edu, and you can subscribe. And that way you'll get uh, 